Thank you very much, Matilda. And in the name of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for the UK, I welcome you all to this very interesting session. Emerging stronger on the other side, what awaits us at the end. It's the second time we do this, and um, it was very successful the first time, and we have a very, very strong uh, group of leaders and executives both here today. And we also have a very, very good and strong moderator here who I would like to introduce, and that will be Nick Gowing. And um, many of you remember him as a lead anchor at the BBC. And also he is the founder of Thinking the Unthinkable, um, and that's a think tank that's very relevant today. But before um, I hand over to Nick and the speakers, I would also like to thank our sponsors, especially AstraZeneca and Handelsbank. And thank you very much, because without you, that would not be possible. And then, of course, also to Thinking the Unthinkable, Nick Gowing, because he's part of this, and also all the Swedish chambers. So thank you very much. And um, just a reminder to all of you, this chamber here was founded in 1906, and we um, have been doing events here for um, a long, long time, and also during the pandemic more than ever, and they've been very, very successful. So thank you very much. Nick, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to be doing this literally for the next uh, 57 minutes, so we will have a hard stop uh, at 11 o'clock uh, London time. So welcome, everybody. I want to get into it very quickly because the question is, uh, emerging from the other side, what uh, awaits us at the end? And I think my question to the four panelists is about whether this is the correct framing. In other words, is there clearly another side and is there clearly an end? Or is that actually framing it incorrectly? Certainly, we've been enduring enormous unthinkables in the last seven, eight months. Or are they really unpalatables? Unpalatables that people didn't really want to grip, particularly uh, corporate and political leaders. Now they are facing them head on, including a fight for survival. Let me go for first comment, uh, literally a, a summary comment uh, to Cecilia Malstrom, who is uh, the former EU Trade Commissioner now in Jotterberg. Uh, welcome, Cecilia. What's your view? What is the other side? Uh, and uh, is there an end in sight? Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Well, I think there is another side, although we cannot clearly define it yet. Surely the economy has taken a, a bit big blow we have seen death people injured hospitalized social isolation huge sacrifices uh, by people companies going bankrupt um, democracy has taken a strike as well in many too many countries and we don't really know whether we are on the other side yet whether there's a second wave coming or whether we can start looking forward. I think there are, there are two scenarios uh, and this will of course depend very much on where you are as a country in your, your pandemic stage. But one positive scenario is of course that we are slowly getting out of there. Here, this, there's a vaccine. Uh, we, we, we can build up our societies. We can learn from, from the mistakes and also learn from the good things that come out of this digitalization and, and new thinking, new ways of co cooperation. And that there is a sort of restart in economic reform, in, in a, a vision to, to build something better and stronger afterwards, a greening of the economy. Uh, and also a joint cooperation to strengthen the international um, multilateral organizations because they have been sadly so weakened after uh, during the, this uh, this time. All right. And that's well, a positive scenario. But the negative scenario, of course, is the opposite, that we see this continued hedgehog, uh, hedgehog strategy that we all crawl up and put our, 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 our sticky parts uh, out and that we continue to, to be very isolationistic um, protectionism everyone on its own uh, a weak continued weakening of international organizations and that that's a very very bad uh, scenario but unfortunately i think it's 50 50 where, where we land all right 50 50 so you're hedging your bets about whether there really is another side and also whether there is an end and certainly uh, sir jeremy farrah who's the uh, director of the Wellcome Trust here has said there will be no end to COVID-19. We have to live with that 
indefinitely. I think Bill Gates has said that uh, in the last couple of days as well. Mm -hmm. Can I invite anyone out there to please put your comments on the, the Q&A or the chat line? Um, we have a team who uh, will look at that and uh, make sure I, I see them in good time. So get your ideas out there as soon as possible uh, because uh, we want to hear from you as much as uh, the, the four panelists here as well. Carl Hendricks Fanberg, let me come to you next. You're chairman of the Volvo Group. You're also chair of the uh, European Roundtable, which represents, I think, 55 major European companies. What's your view of the other side? Is there another side? Is there an end in sight? Well, I guess I have uh, similar views as, uh, as the, the people you refer to. I mean, you can see it in two ways. If you want to see it on the more negative side, there's a recent survey among the 500 biggest company executives in the U.S., and, uh, and they, are, they, they could choose between whether they thought the life would return to something more normal in 21, 22, or 23. And 25% said 21, 20% 22, and, and 55 said 23. I, it, it may be a bit faster. You can be a little bit more optimistic maybe if you look at the way the numbers of infections are now rising again well, there is an obvious lag before you see people sadly passing, but the increases of the passing is not as big now as it was in the beginning. And I think we have learned something over the last six months that the, to take care of the protect the elderly and the elderly isolate themselves better. So the virus spreads in society. I think I'm more in the camp of we have to live with it. It's not going to go easy away. And if you take a 23 for a minute, uh, if you gradually come back, that's a long time in a world of digitalization, climate change. And I think we, we have to think about a different society when we come through this. And we need to gear up and not lose tempo here. All right, Carl Henry, thank you. An idea of what's already been thought about um, among the 80 or so participants so far, this from Charlotte de Jong. Do you see the current changes opening up the world, making it more global, working from anywhere? Or do you see an increased tendency to protectionism as we see with the UK and Brexit and the hard negotiations within the EU? Uh, let's uh, uh, go to um, Business Sweden now, uh, to Ilva Berg, your chief executive of Business Sweden. And I'm, uh, Ilva, I'd like you to, you to define whether you think there is another side, what the framing should be. Can we view this uh, as facing an end at some point? And I'm quoting to you your document, Future Now, which, which really says it could go either way. Yeah, I, I think it can go either way. I, I think that the, the, there is obviously always a, a, another side to something, but I don't think it will look like what we were used to see before the pandemic. I think this uh, has affected all parts of our society in a profound way, both our personal lives business life, but also uh, our geopolitical and global uh, society in a way that uh, is something that we will need to get used to and, and live with for some time. But, uh, but as both Cecilia and Carl Hendrik said, I mean, there are both good uh, tr uh, transformations taking place here now and, and uh, at a rapid speed, and they could go either way. And uh, my view on this is to plan for the worst and hope for the best, because uh, I think that if, if we have a more positive out view and really try to fight for that, uh, I think we can both see business opportunities and maybe also use what we have learned through the pandemic and apply that to other areas in society. But if we don't think this way, the, the future could look uh, rather uncertain, so to speak. But, uh, but there are some uh, good things that are also happening out there right now. Thank you very much, Ilva. Let's go to James Sproul, who is UK Chief Economist at Handelsbank and here in the UK. Uh, and you, this time last year, James, you were working in Downing Street. Before that, you were Chief Economist uh, at the Institute of Directors and also had other uh, engagements with the banking sector too. What's your assessment at this point? Thanks, thanks, Ed. Um Well, just quickly going through what's actually happened in the economy and what's sort of where we are now. Um, what we've said, as the Bank of England has, has pointed out, we've had the worst recession since uh, the Great Freeze of 1708, uh, and the economy shrank by 25%. And we have had what, by any argument, is a V-shaped recovery so far. And we've gained back, and I expect the numbers to gain back, about 20% of that 25%. That'll give us a 5% recession, which is the worst we've had since the Second World War. 
Oh, and by the way, as a very interesting paper that came out the other day, they looked at it and they said, they look in the UK, of course, we've got a, a long period of really good data. Uh, there's been eight pandemics that we've suffered since the Black Death. Um, and typically they have between five and 6% of the economy turns down and that's what we've seen. Um, but I am actually optimistic about the, uh, about the future. And, and whilst I take some of the, the comments a moment ago about how there are dangers about global trade and there, there certainly are, I think actually global trade and globalization is gonna turn more towards the sharing of ideas than it is about the actual transfer of goods. There may be some uh, greater regionalization, less dependence on China that emerges in the longer term. Um, but I don't think that the, the desire for people to talk to one another, to share ideas, share processes and approaches and the analytics, that's going to be the big driving force in the future. And uh, to quote Charles Darwin, I, I think, it, I won't quote him directly because I can't remember it, but um, the people who do well in, in the long term are not the strongest, but the most adaptable. And so I see a great deal of adaptability within uh, many European uh, economies and societies, and I think that's ultimately a huge strength. Well, let's talk about adaptability in a moment, but let me just pick up which, which, which letter of the alphabet would you use to describe where we may be heading, whether in the UK, and there are chambers also joining us from other parts of Europe. So think more pan-European as well, including yeah. Sweden, of course. I think that the, what we're seeing right now is, is, is the, the V because we just, you know, nobody had ever done this before. No, no government had ever said, stay at home, stop shopping. Of course, that had an enormous impact on everybody. Um, but also because we all recognize that we've changed the way that we as consumers shop and when things are happening. So for instance, here in the UK, because we've got some good data, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the same things happen in other places as well. We've seen footfall in retail spaces is only about 80% of what it was, whereas retail sales are back to 100%. So we can postulate that there's about a 20% shift to online. And I'm certain that that shift has gone on lots of other places as well. So companies now need to adjust their models to say, how do we continue to serve our customers? And that might mean more deliveries, less physical presence, and that therefore it takes time. So that last five, five or 6% of the, the economic recovery isn't going to be rapid because it's going to be dependent upon businesses altering how they deliver services and goods to their customers. And that's, that's fine. That's what all of us as consumers demand. Uh, and so I think that for, for every country uh, across Europe, that's going to be a pretty common theme, is the next stage is going to be slower. And that's before I've included the, the effect of the, the, the newest quasi-lockdown that we've seemed to be drifting into at the moment. Thanks, James. Let me just pick up, if I can, Carl Hendrick, quickly on this, because in the last um, of the, the sessions, we, which we did a couple of months ago, it was very clear from Volvo, your group, that actually um, there was a, essentially production of trucks had stopped. And in the, in the pre-discussion we had um, before uh, coming on today, you made clear that actually supply chains are remarkably resilient in many ways. They're adapting very quickly, but you're not selling any trucks. So how, do you, how are you seeing the data at the moment? We are following something we call transport kilometers. How much goods are transported in society? And initially in the, in the lockdown, we were down like 30%, which is just unusual. But it didn't take very long before it was fairly much up again. People still need to eat. People still need to do things. So, so uh, we are basically back to zero. The problem is that any truck owner, fleet owner, can still use the truck another year if he is uncertain. So what it's all about now for us is the belief in the future. And I think this is something that is important and, and where politicians have a particular role to try to balance between not trying to 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 be too to to be too less careful about about the disease, but at the same time create optimism. I I think on the question when someone wrote here, what should we adapt to? I think that was a good one. I agree. I yeah, and I think we we while we are thinking about the pandemic, and and we can we will talk a lot about it in this hour. Don't forget the tools that comes from digital that we showcase in E-Trade and all those things. We will have, after a, a long period of steady development, we're on our way into a time of much more creativity and entrepreneurship. And if you take Sweden in particular, the way we dealt with 1870 to 20, 1930, when, when you had the Industrial Revolution, we created 20, 30 large known global uh, leaders in an unbelievable time of entrepreneurship. 
that's the spirit we need to get today to deal with the tomorrow's opportunities or today's opportunities. And, and we mustn't take a pause in that because of COVID. And I think that eventually is what's going to create the new jobs, the new industries. Let me pick up on that point about adaptability, which comes from Ben Skarstam, um, about the other side can be interpreted as a, as a disturbance of the present. Unfortunately, we must face a new consciousness. What do we need to adapt to? Cecilia, let me come to you because you're now lucky enough to be, maybe I can put it that way, no longer having to, to, to worry about uh, the direction as a commissioner. You can now, uh, you can now pr provide a judgment from your position as a professor at Göteborg University. But what about adaptability? What are you seeing, whether it be in the public service, among civil servants, among those in government service, and those in the corporate sector as well, to realize the scale of change that's needed? Is it actually bringing new reserves, new initiatives, new capabilities, which many had not really seen before? Well, uh, thank you. I, actually, I, I do spend some time worrying about the state of global affairs, even if I left it. We'll talk about but, that but, in a moment. Yes, but, but I, I think we, we, we need to, despite all, all the misery and the, the anxiousness and the uncertainty, we need to, as, as Karl Henrik uh, underlines, we need to see that there's so much new creativity. Companies who've started uh, producing totally different items. Um, we had here in, 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 in Göteborg, where I live, where they started to collect old overhead papers, you know, these uh, shiny, transparent ones that we used in the 80s. They collected thousands and thousands in the new schools, and they started to produce masks on a very basic level, but it protected quite a lot of people in the hospitals and the caretaking homes. And then that went into more, more uh, sort of organized production. And we've seen so many other people suddenly who had no clue on what internet was basically, who are now Zoom, Zoomanians, or what did you call them before, uh, and who have adopted to, to the new, new demands of, of uh, digital meetings and who have board meetings and who have uh, you know, social meetings and, and who have important uh, decisions being done on, online. And we have discovered that whether this is a bit boring and we do miss the personal encounter and the coffee breaks, we can be very efficient and we can serve a lot of traveling, we can serve a lot of environmental waste or, or ecological footprint by not traveling back and forth when we don't have to. So, so we are adapting in, in a way to a more modern society and that's the good part of it. And there's a bad part uh, as well. But, but this, I think we, we should sort of come out with all these good examples uh, showing that, that man, woman, we, we are quite adaptable and, and we, we should build upon that and not make it a sort of one, one, one short uh, term of, of history, but something more, more permanent and encourage that from, from societies, from public, um, pu public uh, uh, demand, from, from companies and from politicians as well. Anilva, are you seeing adaptability among your, your members? Yeah, I mean, I would like to, to touch up on what both uh, James and uh, Carl Henrik and Cecilia said and, and, and share with you that we, we did a survey during this summer. We went out to sea level people, government representatives and academia on 40 global markets and interviewed them on uh, what they see, what type of new business landscape they see. And, and they talked about three different uh, trends or rather transformations that have been accelerated during the pandemic and that will take uh, that will accelerate uh, uh, post pandemic so to speak and what we're seeing as Carl Hendrik was saying is is of course uh, the accelerated dig digitalization uh, with gaming ed tech healthcare uh, becoming much more obvious and, and, and dominating during the pandemic, but also generating new sets of big data that gives uh, ground for new business to emerge. And, uh, and you will see a trend towards increased digitalization basically everywhere. And I, I believe that if we can just make sure that governments now when they're spending all this money build the right type of uh, infrastructure and that we get 5G also here in Europe, for example, I think that we will see uh, new type of companies, new type of business models emerge, like Carl Hendrik was uh, referring to at the turn of the last century between the, the, the 18th and the 19th century. So, so I think that there are some really promising signs when it comes to accelerated digitalization, but also when it comes to sustainability, uh, a force that I believe will become much more 
urgent and we will all become much more aware of how urgent it is for us to respond to the climate changes that are taking place. And also that is a force that is, I would say, playing in, in, uh, in favor of Swedish companies. And last but not least, uh, the, the third transformation that uh, uh, sea level people were talking about, and that is uh, uh, innovation being transformed in a new way. You do innovation much more locally, out on the field, close to where your customers are. And, uh, and that is uh, something that will take place both across ecosystems and also between big, large multinational and small local companies. So I would say these three trends, digitalization, sustainability and innovation, they are really, they are happening at a much greater speed and that, that really provides a groundwork for, for new companies to emerge. Thank new, you, yeah. New jobs. Oh, J J James, what about, what's the data showing you about, uh, about adaptability? Um, this is really interesting. If you look across Europe, there's some, some wonderful stuff uh, collected by a, a group called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is about the universities around the world. Um, if you look at it, um, unfortunately, Europe as a whole is uh, not that great. There's a number of areas, but these Central and Southern Europe, which are um, pretty non-entrepreneurial. But there's also some very, very good places. And that's, I would say, the Nordics, the UK, Netherlands all do extremely well. And you've got a lot of people there willing to... Uh, Start their businesses to take those risks, and I think what Via was just saying was was really really important about the digital. It's you know I'm not a, an enormous fan of industrial policy, but I am an enormous fan of putting in place the right infrastructure to allow individuals to go out and start their own businesses, etc. So you know, and that having that digital infrastructure is absolutely critical to getting that off. And you will find people being adaptive um, if they can get that infrastructure. And I also think that there's another thing which is often overlooked, which is that it's not just about entrepreneurialism and people starting their own businesses. It's about the way a society views entrepreneurialism. And the more that we view entrepreneurialism as a natural part of how we do business, the more that people sitting within big companies, sitting within Carl Hendricks' company, sitting within you know, big, uh, the, the NHS or whatever, where you encourage people to think, often thinking the unthinkable, Nick, but they, they, they encourage them, how are you going to tackle these new problems? Um, not a sort of, this is how we've always done it, this is how we'll always do it in the future. That's the thinking that's gonna to lead to long-term decline. Um, we, need, we want that people really grasping opportunity. Uh, and part of that is, you know, we can see it be manifested in entrepreneurialism, but it's much bigger than just how many people start up new companies within your, your uh, economy. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions, but let me pick up quickly, uh, Carl Hendrick and everyone else, Ilva as well, um, about the issue of reskilling, the awareness that a lot of people have to accept that what they've been doing is not the way they'll be earning money in future. Is there now an awareness of just how profoundly important that is? And here in the UK, we're going to hear later today from the Chancellor some idea of how they're going to tackle this here in the United Kingdom. But Carl Hendrick, what's it, what, what are you seeing across your 55 members of the, uh, of the ERT and also at, at Volvo? Well, let, let me just first uh, continue where, where James left it, because I think this is important. I, 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 I think it's good that we're discussing about these underlying challenges, because they are what we can do something about. And then we have to, with politicians and scientists, think about how we deal with COVID as such. But what this is, is, is not a unique thing. It's, it's a downturn in the economy, but a severe one. But us in business, we have learned that in downturns is when you have a chance to shift your, your competitive position in the market. You can overtake others and you can advance through that. When everything is running fine, everybody can do well. So it's important that we use this time not to sit still, but actually advance. And then, for example, the infrastructure development infrastructure investments it's sad that china and the us are rolling out 5g big time and we are struggling here in the middle it's sad to see that the 70 largest tech companies in the world that 40 are americans 25 are chinese less than 20 years old we have five in europe that they're all over 100 we are not participating in tomorrow's industries and that is of course scary if you go to your particular question we, we, in, we will all go digital just increasingly. And, and we have to upskill our workforce and society needs to upskill society as a whole. 
uh, we uh, we can see in in um, for example in in COVID there I think we all estimate around the table and in the round table that probably 50% of jobs lost won't come back and 50% uh, of those will come back uh, that have been lost will come back with a different profile we have to upskill we use this time to do that and, and make sure that people are employable also after the after covid i think this is this is just the beginning of a something in of lifelong learning that must be more than just a, a principal concept we have to live with it and demonstrate we can do it and, and we're all yeah cecilia do you think um given the the 27 nations of the of the european union um uh, obviously there are there are internal frictions at the moment but do you think the political class can handle this or not 750 billion euros put on the agenda for stimulation the green deal uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. do you think the political class is handling it can handle this because it's all very well Carl Hendrik you saying reskilling and so on and uh, what company leaders understand but there's still the very immediate societal pain for those who lose their jobs at every level of the ladder Cecilia well the money hasn't started to be paid out yet some countries are formulating their their plans and and their priorities uh, we still need to have the approval by the european parliament so there's the political internal jiggle uh, in order to make to get this running as well uh, but but i i really hope it, it can because it's a test it's the first time ever such a huge amount of money is being being agreed upon with, with joint bonds and with, with the joint uh, debt um, management by, by the European Union and it's a test to see if it's working and the needs as you said are gigantic uh, depending on the different countries so so I, I really think so and I've seen that individually in nationally lots of countries are preparing using the best brains they have in the country talking to the industry researchers and others to, to, to make those plans how can we restart in an intelligent way not just put money in black old holes but to make sure that there is a a, a start a reform and had to be combined with joint reforms on the internal market for instance that has been needed for, for for many many years but there's also a worry by some countries who are not as advanced as maybe the scandinavian countries when it comes to green technology many swedish companies are comfortable with this rhetoric they they have made the adoption or they are on the way to do it there are lots of good examples so we need to also make sure that we share experiences best practices that we help other countries to do that transition because they feel a lot of fear uh, in here as well and that risk jeopardizing the whole green transition let me pick up on some other points here um particularly from cecilia your your particular area patrick lay in a post-covid and i have to say post-covid is there going to be a post-covid world if we're living with covid in a post-covid european economy that places greater emphasis on supply chain resiliency and local stakeholder capitalism should business leaders keep supporting free trade and investment in emerging economies outside Europe? Quickly from you, Cecilia, given your role as Trade Commissioner previously. Yes, it should. And can it be achieved? I think so. We should not. I mean, the most dangerous thing we do right now, even if we talk about resilience and a certain amount of, of independence on very critical raw materials and, and medical equipment and so on, we should not fall into the trap of protectionism. That would be hugely damaging for the European Union and also for, for the rest of the world. We must keep globalization and free trade uh, rolling, even if there would be some, some small changes. And it would be a huge mistake for politicians to try to micromanage what companies do in order to, if they need diversifying their supply chains and, and so on. So, so you, the answer to your question is yes, business should continue to do this. Completely what, agree. And what fears Ilva among your members? Uh, and all of those you represent that this is not going in the right direction well, well I'm, I'm totally with uh, cecilia obviously i mean swedish uh, in sweden we depend on free trade and we are an open economy and it would be devastating if yeah. uh, if it was going in, a, in an opposite direction but i also think that i mean looking back the last 30 to 40 years the reason that the world have thrived and we have been able to pick up the poorest countries is because of free trade. And then there are, of course, some uh, flip side to the coins uh, to free trade and globalization. But that is something that we need to continue to work around. But an open economy and free trade is 
important not only to Sweden but to to everyone because it creates wealth uh, and it's it's the right way to allocate resources and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the tendencies that I see uh, that are going in the different direction. But allow me to pick up what Carl Hendricks said about uh, uh, upskilling and investing in Europe and uh, that we might have a chance here now to, uh, to invest in, uh, in, a dig uh, in uh, infrastructure for digitalization. Because uh, when we look at the innovation spendings in the different regions in the world, uh, uh, we also have a legacy, unfortunately, in Europe that is pretty much uh, we, our, our biggest spendings goes to transportation. And that is one of the industries that will see the most change during the next coming few years or 10 years period. And that is also telling us that we need to make sure uh, that we can handle that transformation in a way that doesn't jeopardize the, United, the European Union and uh, jobs, too many jobs, and that we manage to transfer these people into other opportunities. And I think how well we manage to do this transfer of all the people who have been producing traditional cars, for example, and, and turn them into the next generation that will uh, replace cars and, and manufacturing or transportation, that will be a key challenge for Europe. And, and we also need to obviously start to invest in innovation and R&D for, for other areas in a much stronger way. We are terribly behind. Keep the questions coming. We've got 25 minutes to run. Joanna, just please, one uh, comment please do. Yes, come in. Yeah, just one quick comment. There's an old saying that you seldom find soldiers at borders where the, there is intense trading. Hmm. I think this is important. If we start to isolate ourselves, that's an additional incredibly important point. But do you see fear, um, particularly what's happening in Eastern Europe with Hungary, Poland, and one or two other countries, that there's a, a greater nationalism creeping in where COVID-19 has been putting up those borders and creating the need to have security forces. And that in its own way is putting up walls within even the European Union, Carl Henrik. Well, I, I think it's important that success is important in everything you do. I mean, for the reason why you see more of populism is, of course, that our system doesn't deliver. There are times when we, and of course, any one of us are, are strong uh, believers in democracy. We believe that's the way to go. But, but the system must also deliver. And, and you see the opposite of a, of a dictatorship like in China, that they deliver growth and therefore people are pretty okay. So I, I think we have to be humble and, and understand as leaders in our different roles that the system has to deliver. And that's why you see those tendencies. And of course, you have other aspects in, from, from the migration crisis. But I, I think this is... Uh, I'm more nervous about the, the US-China relationship, actually, where that could go. Well, let me, let me just pick up with Cecilia. Do you, do you have fears that what's happening in, in the Eastern nations of Europe, um, particularly after what happened with the frugal four saying, let's not be too generous, let's, let's create conditions when it comes to handing on money, that actually this is, the, this is the next sign of a fragility emerging within the European Union, which should be accepted as possible now, or inevitable rather than something which you're hoping won't happen? No, I think this is a very serious problem that we see in, in Hungary and in Poland, a weakening of the rule of law system, a, uh, a weakening of the free press, a weakening of the free academia, when we see huge demonstrations in Bulgaria, in Romania against uh, a thoroughly corrupt state and others, and we have some problems in, in, in other countries as well. So this is, of course, something we need to, to, to address. It will not disappear on its own. The problem is how you do it. You can use, and that's the big headache of the Commission right now, how do you construct a mechanism where you can withhold some of the money if you don't follow the basic value rules that you adhere to when you join the European Union. Uh, but I mean, all the attempts so far uh, has not really worked. Uh, and this is a growing cleavage within the European Union that some of the, if I can say so, new democracies, 
have been proven to be very fragile and and uh, it's going definitely in the wrong direction and this threatens the eu from within and if we cannot make sure that basic fundamental rights are defended within the european union it's very hard for the eu to be credible on the global scene can i just add a on that Nick? please do yeah um one of the things i think that a lot of the eastern european and central eastern european countries are struggling with is really an existential crisis in terms of they're losing a fairly substantial portion of their population each year. And that for, if you are a politician, a political leader in, in Eastern Europe, and you're seeing one to 2% of your people leaving each year, and you know that it's disproportionately your best, your brightest, your best educated, the people you really invested in, that's, that's really, really bad. And these people are panicking. And I'm not, I'm actually an enormous fan of what the EU does in terms of you know, allowing people to, to move around Europe, et cetera. But I do see there's a cost, and that cost is being borne by these people. And therefore, they're, they're really in a very difficult position. You know, if you are a Romanian and you're seeing that large numbers of your citizens migrate each year to, to Germany, to the UK, to the Netherlands, to, to Sweden, what do you do about that? I don't have an answer for them, unfortunately, but I do see that they've got a real challenge. I think it's worth mentioning that because it's indicative of profound other seismic changes which are underway, not just COVID. So the other side needs to be far more broadly defined. So does the end as well. Let me pick up, we've now got um, 20 minutes to run. I was about to mention Johanna Krisha's question. We will emerge in a changed society, business and personal environment. Which, <coughs> excuse me, which industries do you think will emerge stronger what are the positive societal effects that we can envisage? Who would like to come in on that? Jan well, Hen I, Henrik. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, digital offers a ton of opportunities. And I think we are, we have, if you look at America, it's probably have a, a better uh, level of education on the very top but as a general education of society I think we, Europe will beat them and I think there is a chance we can do lots in digital that this is an entrepreneurship this is like nobody knows exactly what they will do but give them the right opportunities make sure they have the infrastructure there and, and but there will be created a, they will create a, a ton of jobs the, the, uh, on the challenge of green, we must also remember that we will not see a green success unless we have a digital success. Because almost every green idea that comes up uh, is based on new technology. So, so those are almost like twin transactions that has to work together. But between them, that, that's where you see entrepreneurs create ideas and, and jobs. So, which industries? Can you be more specific on that, Carl Henrik, or not? No, I think it's. It's. I think it's totally societal. I mean, if you think about this, is for me this is like if you had asked Abraham Lincoln uh, in 1864 when the steam machine was threatening all labor jobs and everybody would be un un unemployed in a few years, he wouldn't have been able to say what, where the new jobs would come. But you have to give the entrepreneurs the ability. And, and let them lose, and you will see a ton of opportunities uh, developing to reality. Ilver, are you seeing that in Business Sweden? Real yeah, eye opening on that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that the digitalization, we are convinced, will affect everything. And it will affect the traditional manufacturing, the traditional offerings, and they will be remodeled into a new era so to speak but it will also form new business opportunities totally new companies that we haven't heard about with new business models and i also think i i i, I believe also that digitalization will affect the public spending when it comes to building could build a better society like healthcare for example making it available to more people training and education also there making it available to more education and like Carl Hendrik said uh, I think the sustainable revolution that we also need to see it will not happen without digitalization and that's why what we spend our money on here in Europe during the next coming four, three, four, five years will be so in incredibly important. Because if we provide the infrastructure and the opportunities for people to start new companies, 
I think we will be able to produce the jobs that we need to do this transformation. Otherwise, uh, I, I think it will be a challenge for Europe to keep up the pace with what is happening in, in China and Southeast Asia and, and in the US. Let me just pick up, therefore, on what you've said and what Carl Hendrick has said with Cecilia and James. Do you think there is a now a realisation, are we crossing the watershed when it comes to realisation of the enormous economic and business opportunities from the greening of the economies? Cecilia. I think there is, but, but as I said, some, some countries in the European Union would need help to, to realise that on, on, on uh, because there is a huge difference between, if you, to put it simply, between North and South here on the innovation when it comes to, to green technologies. Of course, there, there are nuances in this. But, but, but I think we need to jointly gather those examples and get that debate on a more concrete level. Because um, if I talk to, to friends from, from the Czech Republic or, or Poland, they say, well, yeah, but how can we do it? How, what do you expect us to do? We don't have that knowledge. We don't have that tradition. We don't have that debate and, and role models. So I think we need uh, really to, to have a joint uh, sort of, of um, uh, debate and, and sharing of, of ideas here in order to bring everybody on board. Because as you say, of course, the, the, the potential gains here, not only for the environment, but also economically are huge. James, particularly after your time in 10 Downing Street this time last year, and you were dealing with business, did you get a sense that many of them were moving in that direction or were they just talking about it and almost hoping they could sh shove it onto a, into a siding uh, for, for the time being? No, I, I'm actually much more optimistic than that. I, I think that political leaders uh, around Europe, including the UK, uh, are now clearly having to focus on the immediacy of COVID and what we're doing with all of that. But there is in place a much longer term strategic view on sustainability and how we're going to put that into place and we can see that the the, the, the COP meeting next year uh, I think it's still scheduled to go to Glasgow November um, uh, November of next year yeah that, that I mean there there's an enormous priority on that there's enormous um, focus on the government um, they try to look at the strategic stuff alongside last year it was Brexit this year it'll be COVID um, it doesn't get as much media attention but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of strategic work going on in these other areas as well um, it's it's I, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic about that all continuing and going forward. Um, okay. I just, and, I, and I think that innovation is going to be the thing that makes all of this uh, affordable and, and actually uh, effectively makes it happen in the longer term. It, it's pretty hard to sell, um, please move to sustainable energy that's much more expensive. It's pretty easy to sell, please move to cleaner energy that costs the same as the uh, amount of energy you're using right now. All right. let, let me come in there, because if you go back, I met once the president in, in Indonesia, and he said, what do you want us to do? I have full of coal in the ground, I can almost dig it up for free, and you're asking me to do something more expensive and have a, a population in, uh, that, 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 that needs to do better. This is where, where it kind of starts. But if you look at costs of batteries, when it's not long ago that it was $1,000 per kilowatt hour and we said it has to go down at least to 300 to make it meaningful it's now down to 100 and yesterday tesla talked about cutting it to 50. if you look at at solar energy wind energy you see the same uh, cost reduction so it's becoming available in a way that we never thought was possible so i i, I think there is a i'm actually quite hopeful on green i'm not hopeful for the next 10 years that we will be at the curve we need to be at. But give it 10 to 20 years, when every scientist from the smallest single guy to, to biggest institutions, universities, from the smallest startup to the biggest companies, all are working on this. And, and when you see that happen, as you sometimes see in society, things start to move faster and faster and faster. So I, I, I don't think we should give up on the one and a half degrees 2050. And you've seen that in the company you formerly chaired, BP, where they've yeah. written off $17.5 billion of assets, um, uh, which are dirty assets. Uh, and Bernard Loon is taking the company in a very different direction, um, partly under shareholder pressure. Let me pick up on three or four other questions. Let's go to Eva Garnett. Um, I, I'm not coming to you personally, Eva. Um, research has shown that productivity and efficiency is up when working from home, but also creative thinking and innovation and stimulation is down and employees work more hours. What are your thoughts, panelists, about how to stimulate creativity and innovation in a WFH world? 
Ilva. Oh, I, this is this is tricky. I, I think that workplace will look in a different ways in the future, but I still think that we need to meet each other. I think it's really important for creativity. Uh, I think it's also important for well-being. So maybe a good mix in between could be a solution. But I'm. I think that uh, when I look at our workplace, for example, I think that uh, we will have more people working from home more days a week. But I terribly, I'm very anxious to get people back to our offices again, because that's when creativity happens and that's when we are doing great things really together. Carl Henrik, is, um, is innovation and creativity suffering in a WFH world? Where, where you're working and also among those in the business roundtable? Well, let me first say that BP's uh, change was, was long sought after. Uh, you can't employ young people today or, or even five years ago if you didn't have a plan to how to go green. So it's, it's not sort of a surrender of something they think should be different, but they have to do it this way. This is coming from deep from within. And, and I think it's exciting to see it. Well, I, I do think so, but I think that we are also learning how to use this tool. That there has been, especially if you, like if you are a CEO for Ericsson and the network is down for too long in, in, in the Telefonica in Spain, the CEO needs to fly down and have a chat with a, just to demonstrate. I think that, that presence and, and ambition, that is, I think, is going to change. You cannot, uh, you cannot build relationships, but you can have you can, you can actually do some stuff digital that, that you otherwise did in a much more time consuming way. We are also in Volvo, for example, the, the entire R&D department, I mean, we're talking about uh, 5,000 people there that are in working because they have just given up on trying to be creative sitting at single, single computers. It doesn't work. You have to have the chats, even at the coffee machine and have you heard and someone said, and should we try this? And, I mean, you can't uh, be creative without meeting. So it, it's, uh, I think this is, this is going to be key. James, what's your view? I, I actually agree very much with Ilva in, in terms of, uh, I think that um, working from home is fine, but it, it better be part of a mixed model. And that mixed model really does need to bring those people together. I think it's a strong network effect within an, an, an organization. Uh, my, my firm, Handelsbank, uh, has a really, really great ethos and that ethos is reinforced by actually all of us meeting and chatting together rather than just zooming zooming is fine it, it certainly fills a need but it doesn't fill the whole need and we need to, to move back towards that so i i actually think that cities and that, that connectivity of cities have a very much a longer term future and oh by the way cities are in fact far more uh, from going back to our previous conversation about environmentalism the amount of um uh, carbon emitted by people living in cities is smaller than people living in countryside because they don't need to travel so much because eating is better because a lot of reasons why actually cities are pretty good uh, for a lot of things um, both the way we, we need to communicate and to, to develop but also because it it's, has some environmental impact as well which is, is quite, quite positive. We've got 10 minutes to run let me um, do a handbrake turn and go back to where we were particularly on on leadership and adaptability and skills and where we're taking the emerging from the other side. Christian de Luce talks about what kind of leadership and traits are needed to succeed. Um, <laughs> modern business models and accelerated digitization require a cultural transformation of companies and organizations. And that includes, of course, governments too. Cecilia, what are you seeing, uh, the ability of leadership uh, to actually handle this? Or does it require really a new kind of leadership which some current leaders simply can't adapt to? Well, that is indeed a very tricky question, hard to answer. But if you look at the current crisis as it is now, uh, it's becoming quite apparent that female leaders have been better handling the crisis as, uh, as governmental leaders. Their um, support has be been higher, they have been seen to engage more on a personal level with, with, with the citizens, uh, explaining the, the, the hard measures that has to be taken uh, and so on. You can see that in popularity level. So maybe a more female approach is what's needed for future leadership. Uh, but could, could I break in there? Please do. 
Uh, I, uh, good that you put it that way, Cecilia. I wouldn't have come up with that idea, but, but I can agree with you uh, from a perspective that I think you have to be much more agile. And uh, I would say that uh, things are happening at a much greater speed. We talked about speed five years ago or 10 years ago, but things are happening at a much greater speed. And it's you have to pick up where you see you need to pick up. And I think that uh, you have to be a multi, uh, uh, how should I say, a, a person with multiple skills really, who can keep many balls in the air at the same time. But then at the same time, as Cecilia said, you also need to see the people uh, behind who is doing the job and, and uh, be curious about how they are doing and if they are doing okay and, and pick up uh, how people are doing really. So I think it's two skills really, Ag agility and also, uh, leading with the uh, with the heart, if I may say so. But I think that could also be a male skill, and not only a female skill. James Sproul, how does how much does leadership now factor into the kind of analyses that you are having to do economically? Um, I think it's it's pretty important because it it affects confidence an enormous amount. One of the keys in picking up both what Sid and Ilva are saying is is um. I'm not sure it's about men or women, but it is about the leaders that bring people with them. And that means you don't simply issue orders. The, the, the deference required in a society that just takes orders is banished. And I think that's a very good, positive thing about our societies. So if you want people to go with you, you need to bring them with you. And that means you need to give them the explanations. And that means you need to, and, and the same with a, a good corporate CEO. He doesn't just, she doesn't just say, this is what's going to happen. They say, this is what we're, we've got, we've got a vision. We've got a shared set of objectives and you take people with you. And that's, that requires more explanation. It requires less sort of, it's because I say so. Um, it's, it's sometimes uh, obvious in today's world and, and many times um, too, too much absent. So um, I can point to all sorts of governments in the world, the world haven't tried that and it's not been very successful. Let um, me quote Ben Gladstone here, who quotes uh, Buck, Buck, Buckmaster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Is that what you're confronting in many ways now, Carl Henrik, in the Volvo Group? Well, let me, I think this is an incredibly important question we're on to now. Because I think, I mean, real leadership is to take your organization and, and whatever it is to a place where nobody has been before, even yourself. In an organization that is highly used to change, Ericsson is such a one, they continuously reshape themselves and people get nervous if you don't change because they know that the world around them changes so fast. So the only thing that is clearly gonna lead to failure is if you do the same as you did yesterday. But most organizations, are not used to change. And, and that's where we are, I think, with a lot of parts of, of society. We need real leadership to take us to a better place. And Is that with not, different leaders? Is that with different leaders, Carl Henrik? I, I think sometimes it is. Sometimes people can rise with the occasion. And I think you can take it from the society in a smaller perspective. But I think even there is going to be a demand for leadership in the world. If US and China is pulling apart and becoming more self-centric, that will be a demand for real leadership. And in that sense, maybe this could be Europe's best time. This is, this is, this is time for Europe and European leaders to step up the game. Can they do it? I don't know. Not everybody can. Well, let me go to a final question from Peter Sandberg, the chief executive of the chamber here in the UK, um, who asks, there is a certain lack of groundbreaking visionary policies in Western democracies today. How could politicians, government and business work together on a new deal, maybe a green one and a way forward? What is needed? I'm afraid I have to give you a minute each, but uh, Cecilia, can you somehow encapsulate where, where there could be a way forward here in, in answer to Peter's question? Well, a realization by governments, by companies, and by a certain amount of, of people from the civil society as well, that there is something on the other side, the, the theme of, of, of today, and that we must come out stronger uh, out of this. It will not be the, it's not the first time we, we face a pandemic, it will not be the last time. There will be other huge crises 
basis. So this is an opportunity to really get together, to formulate uh, some, some new visions and to make sure that they are broadly anchored in different parts of, of, of society. Sounds a bit banal, but I think that's the only way forward. Ilva, do you see when you're talking to those you work with and those you work for a lack of certain groundbreaking visionary policies, as Peter's put it? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would like to, well, I would like to say that I see a lack of morale and a lack of boldness. Uh, I would like to come back to what Carl Hendrik said about being visionary, being able to point out in what direction what the target is. And by being, um, uh, have a moral compass in place and uh, being honest and, and dare to make the different, difficult decisions. And uh, I think that what we're suffering from in, in Europe, maybe, and also in Sweden, is that we're sometimes stuck in a democratic system uh, that is difficult to navigate because we have this short terms and uh, you're so anxious to sit on your position that you forget to why you're there, really. And I believe that real leaders, they point out where you're going and what the vision is, and they get the help from the co-workers to fulfill that vision, because you can't really decide what each and every one is going to do. So you need to get the force with you and move them in the right direction. And, and that force right now is, we lack that leadership in the West world, I would say. Uh, both, uh, both in the US, but, but also maybe here in, uh, in Europe, someone who, who stands up and, uh, and can be a, a guide, really. James, lack of groundbreaking visionary policies, is that what you see? Um, I, I actually think I'd probably be afraid of, of a, a policy which had some long-term vision that said this is where we're going in some ways, because I think what's needed is government is a, is a great um, strength in our lives in providing opportunity but it's got to have enough humility to realize defining the final goal is very difficult and a lot of uh, adaptability is going to be needed along the way uh, and so you know how many of us would have predicted 30 40 years ago the digital revolution as it has developed i don't think these things are, are, are forecastable um, but what we can say is people want to make more decisions for themselves government should be enabling that without dictating the terms and actually, I'm pretty optimistic about the longer term as a result of all of that, because Carl we Hendrick, are highly educated. And Carl we, Hendrick, yeah, quickly, I, if you can. Yeah, I would, I would agree with, with James. I think governments need to produce opportunities and, and, and infrastructure education and what have you. The, I think that, as Ulva says, you need a clear vision. I think people are ready to take quite a lot of pain as long as they know where they're going and, and, and why they're going there. And, and they don't care if you go 10 degrees left or right, as long as you get everybody along. And I think that's why the vision is so important. I do think, actually, I'm a little impressed with how the, the uh, commission in the EU have stepped up the game. Um, I think they are better than under, under uh, Juncker and under uh, Barroso. Jacques Delors was a bit of a visionary there, but I, I don't think we should underestimate that difficult situations give birth to unexpected leadership. Thank you all very much indeed. Notice that no one has mentioned Brexit. And as no one mentioned Brexit, we didn't talk about it, even though there are a couple of questions about it. Um, but um, I suppose you could apply Brexit to what awaits us at the end, about, about emerging from the other side as well. But maybe for another day. Um, the drama there has not gone away. Ilva, Cecilia, James and Carl Hendrik, thank you very much indeed for being so sprightly in your, in your responses and for the many questions which have come from all of you out there. We've still got 80 participants, so it shows that we've kept everyone engaged right from the beginning. Jan, the final word from yep. you. Thank you very much, Nick. An excellent job to you and all the panelists. You were marvelous. Ilva, Cecilia, Carl Henrik, James, it was very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And also, once more, thank you to our sponsors, AstraZeneca and Handelsbank. And without you, this would not have been possible. Nick, thank you, and the panelists. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Cheers.